This is lecture four of the Mundak Upanishad and we continue from chapter two, canto two, verse one. Here in this body is contained a great light known by the name Guhachara, the cave dweller. That great truth has been endowed right here. All that which animates flickers, feels, and has the appearance of existence or non-existence, all is established in it. By attaining the knowledge of the Supreme Light, a seeker surpasses all living beings. This immutable Brahman is the light which is subtler than subtle. The whole world and all those who reside in the world are contained in this light. Brahman itself manifests into prana, speech and mind. That alone is real. That is immortal. And it is this which should be known. These two verses speak of the great light. This light is not like the light we know through our senses. Wherever you are in the world, you see the light of two heavenly bodies, the sun and the moon. You see the stars, this is also light. <clears throat> we experience light during the day. We also experience an artificial form of light, which is electricity. This is not meant by it. We experience these lights because of the great light in us. It is this great light within us which is the experiencer. This great light is also known as the Guhachar, cave dweller. And why is it called cave dweller? Because it dwells within you. It's buried inside, deep inside of you, like a light in a, in a dark cave. Everything which exists, which, which is living, which feels, which is sentient, or even that is not existing in the sense of appears to be not living, all this is in this light, and yet this light is in us. It seems like a paradox. It is not. This is one of the most beautiful aspects of our existence. Knowing this light, we know the world. We know all things. This light is so subtle, so fine, and everything is contained in this light. Because this light resides in us, within this body, Guhachar, the cave dweller, therefore this body is a temple. If it weren't for this light, this body would not be a temple. In any temple, in any house of God, God resides. And that is what this light is. It is the deity within the temple that we call the body. And this is what makes the body sacred. If it weren't for this light, this body would be mere matter. 
It is this light which lends it life, consciousness. The quality of this light is life itself. It is not different. They are one and the same. Light and life. We know this light by other names as well. We also call it Atman. We call it Purusha. We call it pure consciousness. We call it the witness, Sakshi. We call it Brahman in its universal form. So this light has many names. Any questions so far? Any comments? Okay, in that case, we'll continue to verses 3, 4, and 5. Holding the great bow of Upanishadic wisdom, the aspirant should fix the arrow of mind, sharpened with meditation, on its target. Draw the string with full absorption and shoot at the target. Oh, my friend, remember, immutable, eternal truth alone is the target. Om is the bow. Atman, the individual self, is the arrow. Brahman, the universal self, is the target. Aim precisely and, like an arrow, become merged with the target. Mind, the pranas and other elements, including heaven, earth and all the spaces between, are held in him. Know only that single Atman, speak of nothing else. This knowledge is a bridge to immortality. How do we know Guhachar? How do we get to know this cave dweller that is in this temple known as the body? To attain that, to know that great light, we need to have some discipline, some sadhana. Nobody has ever succeeded in any endeavor in life without some sort of discipline. Whatever it is that you want to achieve in life, whether you want to get a good job, you want to build a house, you want to make a certain amount of money, so that you can retire and live comfortably. Whatever your goal is for your daily life, without some discipline and perseverance, you know you're not going to attain it. So it is also with the more profound aspect of our life, if you want to know this great light, if you want to know your true self, it is not enough 
to just read the Upanishads. We need to practice some discipline or tapas. Dhyana will take us to our goal. Absorption or becoming one when the individual self becomes one with the universal self. That state of union, also called yoga, can be attained only with some self-discipline. For that goal to be achieved, you need a one-pointed mind. Mind without conflicts. Such a mind can attain this state of union. A divided and scattered mind cannot. Speak of nothing else means the mind should be focused fully on this purpose of life. To know yourself is the highest purpose of life. If the mind is cluttered with many, many thoughts, many conflicting emotions, ideas, images, then of course you are distracted from your goal. And so it says, speak of nothing else, meaning have a one-pointed mind. How to achieve this one-pointed mind is revealed in the teachings between a teacher and a aspirant by sitting close Upanishad means sitting close sitting near sitting near whom? sitting near the teacher and that is exactly what Shaunak, the perfect householder is doing he goes to his teacher and he asks a genuine question, an authentic question. He's listening. And by sitting close, these teachings are revealed step by step. And only through this instructions and guidance can one acquire a one-pointed mind. Any questions regarding a one-pointed mind? Or on discipline? elaborate a little bit more on discipline because it has sometimes a very negative connotation uh, of you know, being strict with yourself or other. Mm -hmm. This is not the discipline that is meant here in this context. And how can you achieve that discipline? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. Discipline in our modern life has often acquired a very negative connotation and the moment you tell a student to do certain things, the modern student um, 
always has many excuses. He has no time. <laughs> He's very busy. And um, he has many obligations. And of course, um, he finds that the modern student, of course, has time for many other things, but does not find time for self-discipline. And this is because the desire is not strong enough. And it is a vicious circle. Because the desire is not strong, there is lack of discipline. Because there is a lack of discipline, there is no insight, no glimpses of the higher states. Because there is a lack of these glimpses, there is no longing or no desire. So you see, we are stuck in this vicious circle. The way out is, of course, one, to listen to these teachings, which are very inspiring, approach a good teacher, an authentic teacher, ask for guidance, ask for instruction. And if you get even a little glimpse, that will strengthen the longing. Without this glimpse, Discipline becomes very hard. Without this positive insights, it's a very hard upward, you know, it's like climbing up a hill. It's a, it's a really a struggle. It's, it's all the way up, you know, and you, you don't seem to get a respite from that. So this discipline can become very hard without smaller glimpses. And these glimpses need to be cherished. These, this longing needs to be strengthened. And that's only going to happen if you, you manage to do something, however small and simple it may be, but do it every day. Do it regularly. So those of you who don't have a teacher or who are extremely busy, I'd even say just one or two minutes every day, just say a prayer internally, in your own words. Not a ready-made prayer, not parroting some prayers out of Upanishads or any other scriptures. This prayer should be from rising from your own heart. It should be that little seed which is in you needs to be strengthened. So allow it to rise up in you. Allow it to germinate. And say a prayer in which you ask for this desire to be strengthened. And if you do this every day, twice a day, you know, in the morning and at night, Already, that's a great achievement. For attaining anything, I mentioned before, you need to put in some effort. So somewhere, we need to break that vicious circle. Is it really that difficult to do a short prayer? It just takes a few minutes in the morning and in the evening. No, I don't think so. I think everybody has that kind of time. And if you have that discipline to do that twice a day, then you will already begin to see some changes in your life. If you can do that every day for a longer period of time without missing a single day, an uninterrupted practice. And a simple thing like that can give you a little glimpse, a little insight, some positive impressions, which will strengthen that longing in you. It's like a little seed has been buried deep inside of you, but if you don't water the seed, the seed will die. If you water it through your daily prayer, it will germinate, it will grow, it will grow stronger. And then as it grows stronger, 
discipline is no longer required because you will be drawn by longing. It's like a magnet pulls you in the same way you will be drawn by this power of attraction. You will long to do this. You will not say, oh, I have to do this. I have to sit and do my prayer or I have to do my sadhana. You will say, I long to do my sadhana. When can I do my sadhana? When can I sit and meet my friend within? And when you do that, when you're able to do that, that you have achieved something great. It's a great step. It's a great progress. Then discipline is no longer something negative. It's no longer some burden. It's like a passion. All the people who are really successful in anything in the world, you will ask them, what is their secret? Ask a great artist, great painter, great musician, what is your success? Why are you so successful? They say, we do a lot of practice and we love it. We just love this music or this art or, or, or writing or poetry or whatever it is that they do. All successful people will tell you the same. They are passionate about it. And when you are passionate about something, you will do it. You will long to do it. You can't not do it. It is your nature to do it. So to get there, you need to break that vicious cycle. And for that, you just need to do a few minutes of prayer in the morning and in the evening. In your own words. And that's all. It's very simple. Nothing complicated. Thanks. I will read verses six to eight. <clears throat> Just as the spokes of a chariot wheel come together in its hub, all the Nari's energy channels in the human body meet in the heart, where he moves while manifesting in various ways. Meditate on Om, which is one with the self. May you reach the other shore beyond all darkness. He is omniscient and the source of all sciences. It is through his greatness that order is established on the earth. In the celestial realm of Brahman, in the eternal space of the heart, this Atman alone resides, manifesting in the form of mind, prana, guides the functions of the body. While seated in the heart, he pervades the whole body. By attaining the knowledge of that blissful and immutable Purusha, the nose of truth see all that shines. Once both shores of life, year and year after, are known, the knot of the heart is destroyed. All doubts vanish and the binding impact of all karma is destroyed. These verses refer to the spokes of a wheel, a chariot, and we all know that the center if you look at any wheel, in the, the center of the, of the wheel, the hub, does not move. That is still. The very center remains still. It's only the spokes of the wheel, the periphery, that moves. And so, this is a beautiful image. It says that this is the center, the very heart of the human body. And there, from there, he is manifesting 
outward in many ways. Manifests in the form of sciences, in the form of celestial realms. While residing there in the center, the entire body is alive, full of prana, full of life. And all these functions in the body are guided through that great light which is seated in the center, in the very heart of the body. And when you know the center, you know all. What does it mean, the heart? Is it referring to the physical organ? I use the words, the very center, the very heart of the matter. It means Not, it does not mean the physical heart, the physical organ, but the center of this body. When we refer to a center, a capital of a, sit, of a country, if you look at a country like India, you may say that the center is somewhere right there in the middle where perhaps you find a, maybe a town or a village or a state like Madhya Pradesh, it's right in the center. That's the physical center of the country. But we know that the real center of the country from where the country's functions where it is administrated from, is the capital. That capital is more in the north, right? New Delhi is in the north. It's not in the physical center of the country. It's not centrally located. So when we talk about the center, we are referring to that part which is still that does not move, but moves everything else. That is pure consciousness. And from that center, everything is guided. And when we know the center, you will know this life and the one beyond. You have knowledge of both shores. You also have then knowledge of the internal and the external worlds. And when you know that, that is high state of mastery, then you go beyond the bondage of karma. You are no longer bound by your karma. You are free from your samskaras. Any questions? Any comments or thoughts about this? In that case, I'll continue reading verses 9, 10, and 11.
In the innermost golden sheath resides pure and perfect Brahman. The knowers of Atman realize this as the brightest of all bright lights. In the realm of Brahman, neither the sun, stars, moon, nor lightning shine, not to speak of worldly fire. It is only when he shines that all these others may shine. It is through his light that this whole universe is illuminated. All this is immutable Brahman. Brahman is before, behind, to the right, to the left, above and below all. This whole universe is an expansion of that highest Brahman. It sounds so beautiful, poetic, and yet esoteric. Perhaps some of you have difficulties understanding this Brahman. It's very mysterious. We refer to this light as the brightest of lights. How can there be a light that's brighter than the sun? And how can we say that the, the sun cannot shine without this great light, without Guhachar? The sun may not shine because there would be no one to know or experience that light of the sun. All this around us all sentient beings, all living beings and all those that seem to be non-existent, all of us and all this is permeated with consciousness. The sun, the moon, the stars included, the fire as well, all these were the sources of light earlier. But it makes it clear that we are not talking about external sources of light. This great light is giving these external sources of light some light. And it is only because of this great light that we can experience these external lights. All this is consciousness. All this is an expansion of that center within you that is still, that does not move, that's unmoving. And that center has the same quality as the entire universe. It's all pure consciousness, all of it. When you really contemplate upon this, you will understand that this is one of the highest teachings of Shri Vidya, Madhu Vidya, Brahma Vidya, whatever you want to call it. It is not intellectual. It may seem intellectual here because you may not have experienced that directly, but you can experience that directly beginning with simple, short steps, very simple discipline. As I answered the question that Joachim asked about discipline, I said a simple thing like saying a prayer twice a day in your own words can be the beginning of a very beautiful journey which will lead you ultimately to this, to knowing that pure, perfect, great light within, the brightest of all lights. That is the light that illuminates all other lights. This is really something to contemplate on. This light is very deep inside of you. 
and I need to unveil this light because it has been covered by many shades. And what are these shades? This is our mind. Uh, all the different movement brought in through manas, the different self-identities from ego, the bubbles of from chitta which keep bubbling up, bringing with it a lot of images, impressions, thoughts. So you see there's so much movement that we cannot see through this, through all this movement in chitta. We cannot see through to that chitta deep within, that light deep within, which is also called just chitta or chaitanya consciousness we cannot see because there is a grosser form of that consciousness which is disturbing when that calms down, settles down then that great light within will be visible We continue to chapter 3, Canto 1, and I will read verses 1 and 2. These two are very famous verses, and some of you may have even seen them, sort of pictor pictorial versions of it. And um, these verses have often been quoted in other scriptures as well. Two identical birds that are eternal companions perch in the very same tree. One eats many fruits of various tastes. The other only witnesses without eating. Seated in the same tree, the deluded Purusha becomes entangled and worries helplessly. However, the moment it recognizes the glory and the greatness of the other bird, it attains freedom from all pain and misery. The first verse is a beautiful image of two birds sitting in the same tree. They are eternal companions. Who or what are these two identical birds? Who would like to venture a guess, an educated guess? Any insights about who or what these two identical birds are? No one, no one would like to, to venture, I guess. You have to tell me. You can speak, right? Freedom. Okay, you, you cannot uh, speak, all right? The background noise, all right, so Shriram says, it is, you mean buddhi, I think. Uh, buddhi and manas. Anybody else would like to guess or knows perhaps? 
Manisha wants to say something? I was just thinking about the one of the birds being the bo- the body mind. Mhm. And the other? That uh, awareness, the like witness. Mhm. Okay. Consciousness then. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anybody else wants to guess? I guess I was wondering about the tree. I know. So anyway, I'm gonna un- I'm gonna mute myself again. Yeah. Okay. You were wondering about the tree before you mute yourself. What were you wondering about the tree? Well, it just says they are the two identical birds in the in the very same tree. Mm-hmm. So, I think we will come get there maybe. So that was influencing my thought about what these birds are. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, it's, anyway. it's, a, it's a good th- thought process of thinking because the tree is also very relevant. But we'll come to the tree as soon as we're done with the birds. <laughs> I know, so I'm saying that's why I was trying to think about yes. how to phrase the second bird. Yes. So, okay, I'll mute myself so there's no more sound. Yes, okay. okay. Survi, I'm... Can you uh, speak? Would you like to venture an educated guess of what it might be? Okay, I'll just guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe the uh, one of the words is uh, consciousness, mm-hmm. and the other one is our desires, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, like desires, and maybe the tree is our body. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Good, good. Okay. Um, you wanted to say something else? Uh, no, thank you. That much only. Mm-hmm. It's just a guess. All right. But, okay, but very good guess, partly. And uh, so kind of everybody got maybe a bit, a bit right. The two birds that are eternal companions must remember that they're eternal. They are not going to die. They're eternal. So the mind cannot be really one of them. Like manas cannot be one of them. Because manas is subject to death. When we drop this body... Manas is subject to death. So it cannot be Manas. One bird which is enjoying the fruits, you know, it eats many fruits, has enjoys the various tastes. This is the Jivatman. Jivatman means, or you just say Atman, it's attached to the jiva, to, to the mind, and it is therefore enjoying the fruits. It's enjoying the worldly, sensual pleasures. Because the paramatman, sorry, because the, the atman is attached to the vehicle, which is jiva. So this is the bird which is enjoying the various fruits. While the other bird, which is only witnessing without eating, is Paramatman. That's the universal self. That's not attached to anything. It's pure, untainted. It was never born, it will never die. While the individual self has attached itself to Jiva, the Jiva will die, but the Atman will not. So that's the vehicle together. So one bird is Jivatman and the other bird is Paramatman. I know many of us tend to misunderstand this and think that one is the mind and the other is consciousness. Actually, they both are consciousness. Only one is consciousness which is 
attached to the world it's it's the jivatman and the other is pure consciousness and so that is only witnessing the tree the tree is very interesting where are they sitting they're sitting in the tree we we'll remember that we have done this when we discussed the bhagavad gita in great detail and we also discussed it here uh, when we were talking about the mandukya and we said that it's like something that comes out of spider you know the web or it is like a tree that germinates and then goes back into the seed this is the tree we are talking about is the body itself from th- with this body we can enjoy these things and these birds these two birds are in this body so pure consciousness is also in this body as well as this jivatman this vehicle and they both are enjoying this world and what is the world that's the tree the fruit in this this tree that's the body and the body does not mean only the physical body body is the whole world the whole world is an extension of the body an expansion of the body we call that expansion annamaya kosha that is why it's called anna maya it's full of food or the physical body is is maintained with food so is this world all these sensory objects are food for us and so whole world is an expansion of this body so the tree is not only the physical body it's the entire world and we enjoy these fruits yeah in this world the second verse then explains to us a little bit and he said the deluded purush becomes entangled so now here a different term is used it says purush purusha is basically the jivatman here it's deluded it's entangled in the jiv, you know the jiva but the moment the jiva recognizes the other bird he sees the other bird and says aha look so witness this deluded one can also be free then you are established in sakshatkara the state of the witness also known as sakshi bhava you become a sakshi or a witness and you get freedom from all pain and misery then it does not mean that all your samskaras have been burnt up in the fire of knowledge it may well be that there are samskaras but these will be lived out during time the passage of time until they are exhausted we speak then of the potter's wheel even when the potter stops working and he removes the pot the wheel still rotates the wheel keeps rotating until it slowly comes to a stop so if you've attained sakshatkara even though you may not have burnt up all your karma you become a jivan mukt you become a witness so all the samskaras will manifest but they will not stick to you you are a jivan mukt you are free from that bondage of karma does that make sense does that help understand this very beautiful metaphor very famous very uh, popular in the scriptures has been used in different places
Any questions about this or any comments to it? Uh, yeah, Radhika ji, there's one question. Yes. So as per Yoga Sutra, what is there to stand here? Purusha Vishesha is mm -hmm. Paramatma and then Purusha is Jivatma? Uh, Purusha is Purusha is Jiva Atman. Uh, sorry, Purusha is Atman. With, okay. Without being attached to the world. It's pure Atman. It's individual self. It's only when that Purusha gets associated with the world, with the mind, then it becomes a Jiva Atman. And then that's why here it says the deluded Purusha. Prakriti is something else. Prakriti is the whole world. That's the universal self. That's everything. But in Yoga Sutras, in Sankhya philosophy, it is used in a different way. In Vedantic philosophy, in the Upanishads, it's used in a different way. So, that's in Tantras we say Shiva and Shakti. In Vedanta we say Atman and Paramatman. In Yoga Sutras, we say Purusha and Prakriti. But there, there, these are three different approaches to life, philosophy of life. And there are slight differences in that. The highest way of looking at the world is from the Tantric approach and Advaita approach or Vedantic approach where everything is ultimately consciousness. And yoga, that, that stops at a certain level with Purusha and Prakriti and this goes further. That becomes a theoretical thing. <laughs> I don't know whether this helps. So I try to keep the discussion more at a practical level using these nice metaphors and... Uh, uh, insights. Those who study the Yoga Sutras, of course, um, tend to generally get a little bit more uh, theoretical approach. And um, yet with practice, one can find a good balance even with the Yoga Sutras. With this beautiful... Um, verse here since uh, the Yoga Sutras were mentioned I thought that after we complete this Upanishad the Munda Upanishad we can do the Yoga Sutras um, the essential Yoga Sutras as you know the Yoga Sutras can become very intellectual, very difficult. So we would only do those that are more essential for our understanding, more practical. And that would be after we have completed the Munda Upanishad. Since we have a few more minutes, I can read verse 3. When the aspirant realizes Purusha, the consciousness that is self-effulgent, the true force behind all actions, the Lord and the source of knowledge, then such a wise seeker washes off the samskaras of all virtuous and non-virtuous deeds, becomes pure and attains the highest state of equanimity. Sakshatkara that is when one is established as the witness and all the samskaras are washed off. As I mentioned, that even if they are not burnt in that fire of knowledge, it is possible that these will be manifested and the wheel comes, rotates slowly and finally stops, which means that the samskaras that have to be manifested are manifested and then we are done. You do not acquire any new samskaras. 
and you are free from the bondage of karma. Any questions regarding anything we discussed today? Since we have a couple of minutes as yet. Okay, no questions. In that case, we can stop here. And we will continue next Friday, same time. Have a nice weekend, everyone.